have a special treat this morning. We have Boss Chusing. We've actually already heard a little bit about Boss's work. Uh, Luis introduced his work on uh, early work on modeling uh, lactococcus metabolism uh, in 15 years ago. So now Boss is going to give actually a whiteboard presentation. <laughs> Uh, which is pretty unique, I think, among research seminars on flux balance analysis. <laughs> yes, thank you. Because you, you, this, these genome scale metabolic models, you, you talk about, let's say, a thousand reactions or something like that, which is difficult to draw. Mm -hmm. So that's not what I will do. Uh, this is really like a sort of tutorial, basic, on metabolic networks, and then in particular the approach the stoichiometric approach that allows you to actually expand into these thousands of reactions. But the examples will be s smaller so that I can actually go through the basics of the, the, the ideas, the concepts, and also a little bit of the math behind these methods. Um, so it's about metabolism and metabolic network, very important <coughs> part, I guess, of a whole cell model. Um, and how are we modeling these type of, of networks? If we take a very, very, very simple network, just two reactions, one intermediate, and we will have some sort of source, and we will have some sort of sink. Let's say this is the substrate of the whole thing, and this is the product of the whole thing. Can you, can you see this in the back or not? It's OK? Um, and so, I underline this, which means we, 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 we say they're fixed. And that basically means that the change of substrate concentration, let's say extracellularly, if this is extracellularly, is much slower than the dynamics inside. And so this can be seen as a very slow or fixed variable. It doesn't really change. Maybe gradually, we'll, we can come back to that. And the same for, for this. So we have a source, we have a sink. and um, and now we can describe what's happening in the system, and we're going to use a uh, differential equation for that. So it was actually already on the board this morning. So we say we basically have only one variable left, that's x in this example. So we want to know what the rate of change is, which now is v1 minus v2, right? Very, very basic. Now, one thing you can do with these small systems, which is very powerful, is to make graphs. I like to make graphs because they're very insightful what's going on. So let's make a graph of how these, these, these rates, these rates will now depend on parameters, they will depend on concentrations of S and P, but also on the concentration of X. Right, so I'm now interested in how, this is better, so how these rates change as a function of X. Now for V2 that's easy, sort of, this is the Substrate of that, let's assume Michaelis Menten. In the afternoon, you'll get more on that if you don't know what it is, but it looks like this. And let's say that X is the product of this, so it inhibits. So that may look like this. And so this is kinetic information that I have to draw these lines. And now, of course, the, you could have an expression level of this enzyme, and this would just shift these lines up and down. But given a certain expression level of enzymes, given their kinetics, this curve, we can now find one interesting point here where V1 equals V2, because I plotted V2 here, V1 here. And this is now my steady state. This is where the rate of change is zero, right? If these are equal, it's zero. So this is my steady state. And you can easily see from this that it's actually also stable. So if I would be here in time, I can see that my rate of consumption is higher than my rate of production, so I tend to decrease, and so this thing is actually an attractor, as we call it. So it's an attracting thing. And so we have a stable steady state here. And it's unique if we know all the parameters, we can actually sort of calculate that point, <coughs> and we know what the flux is, the steady state flux for the system, and we would know what the steady state concentration of X would be. And so this is very simple, and it's very um, interesting to do this for smaller systems, but now we have a metabolic network of, uh, well, I don't know how big the one is that you're working with, Louis, but maybe that's 150 or 200 reactions. 
but if you look at yeast, it's close to five, 1,500 reactions. Then this gets tedious. Even if we would know all the kinetic parameters, it would be tedious to draw these type of curves. So what we do in these genome scale metabolic models is we just say, you know, we're, we're going to end up in this steady state anyway. So let's throw away all the dynamics. Let's throw away all the kinetics and just basically assume that we are in steady state. Right? And we just say, OK, these things should balance. So the first thing that you do is what we call mass balance. Okay. For every internal metabolite, we have a balance, and they are all zero. So, they're, so we're in steady state. And now, of course, we get, instead of this picture, we get a different type of picture, which is now in flux space. So as soon as we throw away kinetics, we throw away metabolite concentrations, in a way. Because what kinetics do is they transform a concentration into a rate. And that's what it does. But now we throw away kinetics, so we can throw away the metabolites, basically. We can come back to it later if, 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 if there's time, how to get them back into it a little bit. But let's say the classical approach is they throw them away, and now we're in flux space. So we now have V1 and V2. And basically what we know is if we impose this constraint, it's also called constraint-based modeling. If we impose this constraint, well, it should be on this line, which is already quite a reduction in possible states, right? But we don't know where, because therefore we need the kinetics, right? So we, we, we then have a solution space rather than a specific steady state that we can calculate. The interesting thing, of the, the, the nice thing is, is that we now only have linear relationships between fluxes. And though we're in the linear domain, which means we can scale up very easily, it's no problem to scale up. And so that's the advantage of, of this approach. Um, but we have to think flux space now. Now this is a very simple, actually, I haven't specified anything. It could be negative, actually. But I, I always draw lines, we just always realize that, and we can come back to that, that of course reactions can go two ways depending on the concentrations of metabolites and the delta Gs, etc. Okay, this is a bit too simple to, to do something useful like uh, optimizations, and so we need a little bit of a more complicated solution space to play with. So I'll throw this away and I'll come up with another example. And it's sort of realistic, so I start with glucose, which again I assume is fixed. And I have glycolysis, and I end up with an intermediate, let's say pyruvate. And with this, I generate two ATP. Let's call this reaction one. And now we have two alternative pathways. One is making lactate. That's lactic acid bacteria. I worked with lactic acid bacteria. I learned how to do FBA with this. And I, and, well, you'll, you'll figure out why. OK. And we have acetate as an alternative fermentation product. And here you get an extra ATP. And now since this thing only produces ATP, and this is also, we also need an ATP sink. Otherwise we can never get a steady state. If you want to have a steady state, you need a source and a sink. Right? So we have reaction four, which turns ATP into, let's say, biomass. Not possible, you need carbon, but just for, for, for the idea, right? So this is our, our network, four reactions, and we have two variables now, ATP and X. Right? And now we can make a mass balance for these two variables. And the way you can do this, well, let's write them down first. So we have the XDT, which is V1 minus V2 minus V3 equals zero. Um, I'm just writing down, and if, if, if somebody says, hang on, I'm not following, please shout. Yeah? And now we have for ATP, we have another balance. And it's two times V1 plus V3 minus V4. 
Right? So again, we have linear equations in the rates or in the fluxes. Right? Now, <coughs> the way you would want to write this down if you have a thousand reactions is not like this, but you do this, you, you ask the computer to do it, and he will make a matrix. So I'll just write down how you would write this down in a matrix notation. And then, uh, where would I do that? Here. And I, do, I use a dot for the x dt. The physicists know this, but uh, it's easier. So I have now a factor of metabolite changes. And now I just write, I score these coefficients, these stoichiometry coefficients. I score this in this matrix. And so here I have V1, V2 as columns. 3, V4. So it would be 1, minus 1, minus 1, 0. And it would be 2, 0, 1, minus 1. And here I have my flux factor. Right? This is how you would write it down in matrix notation. And there may be a few biologists that don't know how to multiply factors and matrices. Is there anybody who doesn't know how to do that? We're all happy? OK. So, all right, so this is how, how you do it. And now you can write down immediately. Oh, now you can see a few things. So one of the things you can see is that we basically have, we have four unknowns, let's say variables, four fluxes. Remember, we're in flux space. And we have two balances, so two equations. Right? So we have four unknowns, two equations. This means that we have the two degrees of freedom. So this, the solution space, so to speak, would be dimensions two. Right? So we have an underdetermined system. And um, you can look at that solution space, and there's an interesting way to do that. And for that, I want to, so, so basically, what it means is that I need to know two fluxes, and then I can calculate the others. So another way of saying it, you could, you could choose two independent fluxes, and give them, a, let's say, a number. And then the other two would be calculated based on these, on these equations. Right? Turns out, for this example, it's most convenient to choose these two guys. It's also biologically interesting, because you might want to know, is it making lactate or acetate? And this actually switches between those things. So, um, so let's pick these two. So now we want to write V1 as a function of these two independent ones. Right? So that would be V2 plus V3. Right? And um, we need V4, and V4 is 2 times V1, so that's 2 times yeah, V1 plus V3, right? It's always good that it makes sense, right? Here you get 2 ATP, here you get 1, so this, so this should also always make sense. So that means it basically is this substitute, I substitute this into here, right? So this would then be 2 times V2 plus 3 times V3. That's V4. Yeah? So V1 and V4 are now written as a function of the independent ones, the free ones, so to speak. Yeah? And again, you could write this in matrix notation. And you could say, OK, I have all my rates. Uh, sorry, I do the independent ones up front. 1, V4. And now I get a matrix here. 0, 1, 0, 1. So these are these two because I'm making them as a function of V2 and V3. Hello? So V1 is one, one of that and one of that. And the other one is 2 times V2 and 3 times The computer will automatically do this for you, this, this stuff. But I show this because now you actually see what, what, what you can do with it. This has interesting interpretation, these columns of this, of this matrix. Because if you look at it, what does it say? This column says, OK, I have V1, V2, and 2 times V4. So I have V1, V2, and then 2 times, so that's actually this. V1 
thing here. That's this column, k1. And the other one says, no, I can also do 1 times v1, and then v3, and then 3 times v4. And that's this one. And basically, this, this is then, let's say, k2. And these things are, are sort of flux modes or, or, or extreme pathways. They are actually factors that, that, uh, that span the solution space. So we, remember, we have a two-dimensional space. So we, we have, I'll, I'll come back to that in, in a second. But we have two degrees of freedom, so our solution space is two-dimensional. And so we need two factors to span that space. And these are the factors, and they actually have an interpretation in these networks as pathways, in a way. Right? It's the pathway from glucose to lactate, and the pathway from glucose to acetate. Now, this, this is sort of four-dimensional. That's very inconvenient. And the blackboard is two-dimensional. But luckily, we have a two-dimensional solution space. So we can actually draw this solution space on this board, because the board is also two-dimensional. So I'll have to do that, and I'll throw away some of it. I'll keep the pathway. <coughs> Sorry, of course. Uh, all the, uh, this is linear in V, but each V might be non-linear in X, is that true? Yes. So, yeah, sure. Yes, but we've thrown that away, luckily. Yeah. <laughs> now, of course, a lot of the interesting biology comes from the dynamics and stuff like that. So, so we lose a lot, but we can discuss that later in the in the, what we actually lose. Yeah, I just thought that we can represent like reactions that are not first order. Yes, we can. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is this 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 can be anything. There can be negative feedbacks. Everything can be there. We just ignore it. We're just assuming that in the end, somehow everything comes fine, and we end up in a steady state. And we're looking at that steady state. Yeah. Okay. So this solution space, this steady state solution space, um, we now remember. I I said I've, I've thrown away too much. We will we'll get it back on the board. Um, I picked V2 and V3 as the independent ones. So I, I, I display the solution space on that plane for V2 and V3. Uh, and now basically, so far what we know is that this whole plane is now my solution space. So anything can still happen. So it's not very, very useful to stop here. We need to add a few more constraints. And I think Bernard Paulson, who's one of the pioneers in this, he, he uses the analogy of Sherlock Holmes. And he says, so you have to eliminate the impossible, and whatever remains is the, is the truth, something like that. So it's like constraint based model. So we have to add constraints. And I think the key of using these type of models is in having the right constraints there that make biological sense. That's the, that's the key to using these things. So we need some constraints. Otherwise, we have an infinite solution space. So one constraint that we can use is say, OK, let's say we have a limited uptake capacity. And actually, Louis has measured this, and it's actually 10. Right? He's measured everything, so 10. So, so now we have a constraint, because now we can say, well, hang on. Now, V1 means it cannot be, and say it's also only taking up. It's not excreting this stuff. So now I have a bound on this rate. Yeah. Some people call this a capacity constraint. You can call it just bounds on a rate. Yeah. Say we have this as a constraint. We can actually put this, such constraints are lines in this solution space. And in this case, we've, you may remember that V1 was actually V2 plus V3 in steady state. Right? Going in here is equal to going out. And so if this one is constrained, these two guys are constrained. Right? And that basically is a line. So we have 10 here, 10 here. We would have a line like this. So everything above that line is forbidden, because you would need more v1. And this, this is the bound. Yeah? So we can throw away this part. 
Yeah? And uh, it's still not um, uh, finite. It's not a bounded solution space because I can go to infinity or to, to, to negative fluxes. I can have this going to happen, right? which actually does happen sometimes. Right? If these guys run out of, they first make lactate and then later they make acetate under some conditions. So this is possible. But for, for sake of, for, for now, um, it's probably wise to put another constraint. And let's say that um, uh, Louis also measured the Vmax of lactate dehydrogenase, this enzyme, and uh, it, it turns out to be eight. <laughs> right? So I have another constraint here, eight, right? And we also know that acetate is only being produced, it's never being consumed. Right? Or there could be a thermodynamic argument. You may know that actually the equilibrium constant of this thing is a thousand or so. So that would mean that only if this is a thousand times higher than that, you could go the other way, which never happens. But this is biological information that you have to add. So this actually means, what do I have? I have this constraint, V2, 8. And I know V3 is larger than zero, let's say, right? Can I go back? What? And this, this biology and, and, and physics in here, or chemistry in here. Right? So that means that V3 has to be positive. So we can throw away this part and this. So, so this would now be my solution space. And you see, the more information I add, the more I can eliminate. Yeah? Um, and now let's, for, to make it simple, let's actually also say that, oh, I actually did it already, that V2 has to be positive. It's automatic. Yeah. It shouldn't do it. I've done it already. So that make, gives us a very convenient solution space, right? <coughs> this is a little bit like maybe you've seen some of these papers on FBA and Pulse and you have these flux cones, these, right? This is a sort of a flux cone in 2D. It's easier. Yeah. So the idea is you have this whole solution space and you cut through with constraints, you cut through the solution space until you get a bounded solution space. Because now we have something we can, we can talk about and we can think about and we can maybe find optima in it, which is what FBA does. So let's now move to FBA because I think that was the that I ex explained what FBA does. Um, so FBA simply looks for an optimum in this solution space. Right. So first you need to have a network, then you need to have this cast in a stoichiometric uh, model, then you would have to add capacity constraints, and then you can start thinking about optimization. And it's very simple. It, in mathematical terms, FBA, so flux balance analysis, says, okay, I'm going to minimize or maximize some objective value z, we'll come back to that, what that is, subject to the mass, the mass balance constraints. So that was this um, stoichiometric matrix times the fluxes is zero. You may remember I had this stoichiometry matrix times the flux matrix, and that should be zero. That basically means we're in steady state. Yeah. And then we have these, these bounds, right? So for every rate, we have an upper and a lower bound. Lower bound, upper bound. And this is it. Huh? And uh, there are very powerful solvers that can do this for thousands of these type of linear equations and these constraints, and they will just find the maximum or the minimum for you. Uh, I will not go into the, the, the technical details of the algorithm. I would have to have prepared that, I have to say, because I also pressed the button and it <laughs> comes out. But I can illustrate this graphically, what actually happens. So, so for this example, let's have a, um, an objective. Let's say I actually threw away the most important reaction of this whole thing. Nobody yeah. complains. The V4, right? Yeah. Because that's growth. That's the biomass. So let's, let's say, okay, cells care about cells, so about biomass. 
they care about themselves. So let's say that this network actually is supposed to generate all the goodies that you need to grow as fast as possible. In this case, only ATP. Uh, so that means, so let's say that actually Z is V4. Right, so our objective is to maximize V4. Yeah? Okay, and uh, V4 was 2 times V2 plus 3 times V3, if I remember correctly. I think so. So that's, so, um, so we see that our objective is actually, you can cast our objective function, and this is always the case, in terms of these fluxes. And it basically means our objective function is a line in this space. Let me, let me show this. So if I rewrite this, As, as a straight line, you're all familiar with y is ax plus b, right? Um, I can say, okay, so v3, that's my y-axis, is um, a bit tricky. So one third of this, I divide by three, of, let's call it z, so that you know it's yeah, z, c4, and then it's minus two-thirds of V2. This is just rewriting the objective. Right? But you see it's a line, actually, this objective in this space. Can you see it? Everybody okay? So this is a line with an offset of one-third offset, and a slope of minus two-thirds. Yeah? So it would be a line, I don't know what Z is, I'm going to try to find Z. So it's a line with two thirds, something like this. It's exaggerated, well, you, you, you know what I mean, right? This should be two thirds. Minus two thirds. I'll write it down so you know, okay, right? Slope. And so what it basically the algorithm does is, is, is playing with this Z, this value, until it reaches the maximum point that is still feasible. Remember, this is our feasible solution space. So it, of course, has to be in that space. And so you can easily see it's this point. This is where our intercept is the highest, the objective value is the highest, right? It's 10, so that means set is 30. Now, if you know, no, it's okay. So this is the technique, and now let's do the biology, and you see it's bloody obvious, right? I mean, what did I do? I constrain the input flux here at 10. So this cell is not allowed to take up more glucose than 10 units per second, minute, hour, whatever, right? And now I ask it to maximize this thing. And this thing needs ATP. So obviously you would want to go via this route, so maximize V3 because you get 3 ATP and therefore you get 30 ATP because you had 10 flux of 10, so you get 30 ATP and this runs then at a rate of 30. Yeah. If you would have picked the other one, you would be here, let's say, you would end up with 20. Yeah, which is not optimal. 30 is optimal. Yeah. So this point here is the optimum, and in this case it's unique optimum. Um, and it also shows you would want to go via acetate. So FBA would predict in this case to make acetate, if you want to grow as fast as possible. Yeah. Now the problem is um, that this is actually a realistic scheme from a lactic acid bacterium. And it's called a lactic acid bacterium because it's making lactate and not acetate. It only makes acetate at very low growth rates, at very low concentrations of, sh of sugars. Then it starts to make acetate. But if you give it a nice amount of lactose, it likes milk, so let's say lactose, it would start to make lactate and not acetate. And this is a general thing, and this is, I think, a very important limitation of FBA that you should be aware of. 
This is all stoichiometry, right? It's all about how much comes in, how much comes out, right? And it basically tells us that if I have glucose, I can maximally make three ATP out of the glucose given the stoichiometry, right? And if I make this a rate, then I get a rate of, of, of ATP production, but it's really dependent on the stoichiometry, right? So if I get three ATP out, but I now pour in 10, I get 30 ATP out. So this, this rate that I get out of an FBA, it looks as if we're maximizing growth rate here, but we're actually maximizing growth rate conditional upon these constraints. And if I increase these constraints, I get an increased growth rate. So we're not predicting the growth rate per se. If you want to predict the rate, you need kinetics. So what we're basically doing with FBA is given the constraints that we impose on the network, the capacity constraints, the bounds, what would then be the highest rate? And then, the mo and then automatically this network will find the flux distribution that will give you the highest yield on that limiting substrate. But this is a very important point. So if somebody is, is lost or doesn't, didn't get it, then I'll explain it again. Right? So it's, you do get a rate out, but it's conditional upon another rate, so you always get a high yield strategy out of these models. Meaning you will always respire, you will never ferment in these models. Yeah? That depends on your choice of objective function. No, it doesn't depend on the choice of the objective function. You will all, it, of course, the flux distribution depends on that. Mm -hmm. But any time where you have a choice between, let's say, two different flux distributions, and you, you always need an objective function, of course, in FBA, there will be some limit, something will limit at some point, and then you will see that you will get the the flux distribution will give you the highest yield on that limiting Newton substrate. So if it's ATP, let's say, that you want to maximize, in this case it will be the same. Um, but you will then, you, yeah, you would always get the highest yield distribution. Um, yeah, that's a good point, actually. So, so different objective functions, so maybe that's also an interesting thing. So, so we now talked about sort of growth as an objective function. Um, you could also think of maybe a product. Some of you are interested in making a product, right? So you could also say, let's maximize lactate production, right, in this particular case, right? And, and then you would end up here, right, at eight, because you have a constraint on eight, right? But now, what's interesting is now you see that there's actually a a range of possible solutions. This is another important thing that you have to realize. If you do FBA on a realistic model, you will never find a unique solution. You will find a unique optimal value for Z. That's unique. It's a linear system. There's only one optimum for that. But there can be different ways to roam. So there can be different flux distributions that give that maximum rate. And, and here you see there is actually a whole range of flux distributions. Yeah? And there are tricks for that to, to, to do. So if you do FBA, you get a solution, you get some flux distributions, you should always check whether there are multiple solutions or not. And the trick to do that, it's called flux variability analysis, FVA, flux variability analysis. And basically what you do is you change this a little bit and now you say, I'm going, so now I'm going to change this into FVA. And now I say, I minimize and maximize every rate subject to these things. But on addition, I say, and uh, Z is Z optimal. So I, f I fix my objective value. So I just, in this case, I would say, okay, my rate V4 is 8, V2 is 8. And now what's the minimum and maximum rate that, that all of these reactions in the network can take? And then uh, you, you will find, for instance, for V3, you will find it's, it's between 0 and 2 in this case. Yeah? 
Does this problem only happen when you get the edge of constraints? Could you, if you're not at the, if you're not at the edge of your search space, could you? You will always be in the edge of a search space because you're looking for the optimum. So there's no way you cannot be on the on the edge. But the edge could be not a point but a line, let's say, right? Uh, or in multi-dimensional space, could actually be a subspace. So you can have, you have an, an optimal solution space. And there's, there's techniques and, and, and stuff for the people that want to go a bit more advanced. There's some stuff to read, and I can send you some papers on that. Uh, but but it, I think it's more the concept and the notion of there is flux variability within the optimum, even. That's, I think, important to realize. And another thing that I want to uh, point out using this example is um, a concept that I find very useful in using these models because the last time I want to spend on, you know, the, what can you do with these models and how can we use them in these, in these big models. Um, and it's called a reduced cost. A reduced cost. It's basically a sensitivity analysis. And what you, basic, what you do is you say, okay, I found my optimum. I found my optimum because I hit some boundary constraint. Now, what would happen to the objective value if I would relax that boundary constraint a little bit? So basically what you do is you take these boundary constraints and you would in increase it a little bit and then see if it has an effect on the objective value. And if you do FBA, you get these for free because actually the algorithm uses that to find the optimum. So you, you actually get them sort of for free in any solver you, you use. Um, so that basically in this example, you could, you could then identify which constraint actually limits that rate. So remember we had a growth rate of 30 and I want to improve my growth rate. Oh, right. So which of these uh, limits, which of these constraints limits that? So then maybe I can do something about it, right? And in this case, there is, so would it help if I would increase the, f the, 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 the limit on V3? No, it wouldn't because it's actually infinite already. So you can increase V3 up a bound, doesn't matter. Obviously, in this case, the only thing that matters is V1. Remember, this is really, this point here is dependent on V1. If I would make V1 11, I get 33. If I make it 12, I get 36. Right? So you will find then that um, I get a reduced cost for V1. And this immediately identifies sort of, as, remember, say you want to grow on a rich medium. I guess your mycoplasma needs a lot of stuff to grow on, right? And you've measured these uptake rates, so you put capacity bounds on it, and you know the and you, then you start to maximize growth rate. You can identify which of these medium components limits your biomass formation. And this could be useful for, for instance, for medium optimization or medium design, these sort of things. So I think these reduced costs are very useful if you combine it with data. And if these constraints are dependent on uptake rates that you've actually measured then you can start to, to explore these models. Really using FBA to predict a flux is tricky because of the yield versus rate argument that I remember, right? Remember, we're doing always high yield strategies. And if you think about evolution, the whole idea of FBA is that, we, that evolution optimizes things. Uh, but if you think about what actually is optimized in evolution, it's, uh, it's fitness, of course, but what is fitness? Uh, at least under constant conditions, it would be growth rate. So if you're in a biotech company and you would start to grow cells to produce stuff, mm. you will see that you will at some point start to select for faster growing cells. Faster growing cells. So not cells that, that have a higher yield, but cells that grow faster. Right? And the reason why lactic acid bacteria make lactate and not acetate, as FBA predicts, um, it's because they can grow faster if they make lactate. And why this is, is something that we're, I think, still thinking about, but we're, we're, we're getting to that. And, 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 and maybe I can allude to that a little bit more. Um, 
You see, because there's another limitation with this, especially if you think about this in these, these, these whole cell models that we're talking about. And this is, um, we're only looking at metabolism here. We're only looking at stoichiometry of how much ATP do I get? How much amino acids do I get? How much product do I get? That basically the difference between these things is the metabolic stoichiometry. We're, we're not talking about the proteins that you need to actually catalyze these reactions, which in a whole cell model you would want to take into account, right? And so what we're not taking into account at all is the cost. We're only looking at the metabolic benefits here. And this has a higher benefit, making acetate, than this. But now suppose that this machinery here, this is actually, in reality, this is five enzymes. And there's, there's, there's two of them there that have a, a lousy equilibrium constant, let's say. So we, you would probably need much more protein to get the same flux for this here than this lactate dehydrogenase, one reaction, very high catalytic activity. So that's, this is relatively cheap to do. And now you get a game between costs and benefits. And, um, and at some point, apparently for lactic acid bacteria, they can grow faster if they do this, because they can get a similar rate of ATP with using less protein. And then they can use this protein for Ian's ribosomes to grow faster. But the redox balance. Well, that's another thing, but uh, it, this part, yeah, yeah, sure. But, but even then, you know, of course, an FBA model would take care of the, of the flux balance. And, and here, but so... I that it would be costly for the cell to the LDH. Yeah, I let you go to it. Yeah, yeah, but that's, uh, I didn't, yeah, okay, of course. I didn't, I, I, I kept it simple. Mm -hmm. But uh, you should make something else to keep the redox balance. But even then, so that's why you need five enzymes here. Uh, so, but the, the, so the interesting thing is, you need to add more constraints to become more realistic. I think this, this classic FBA approach, everybody sort of agrees, is too simple for real predictions. It's really nice for things like uh, gene knockouts and see if, uh, if you're viable or not. So let's say more qualitative questions, they're fine. Or you could think of, um, okay, given the network, what, what is the minimum number of nutrients that I need to support growth? or what are all the possible nutrients it can grow on, right? These sort of things. And then you could say, okay, and now I have another bug and I just try to calculate what are all the possible products it can produce. And you, you know, these sort of things you can do with FBA. You can get the maximum theoretical yields out of this. If you want to make something, produce something, you know what to aim for. Um, but quantitative predictions, which it's simply too simple. So we need constraints, additional constraints. And I, I want to finish with one that I'm... I mean, do yeah? people, for example, put us... You can imagine you can put us constraint on the fluxes, the, the copy number of the protein, for example. Exactly. That's where I want to go. Yeah. yeah. So that's where things are heading, also in the FBA field, let's say, which I think is very exciting. And um, um, we get amazingly good uh, predictions with, with that. Uh, so then... Um, I'll just throw this away now. We've, we've seen this enough. And, um, and this has to do with this, this whole protein economy and the cellular economy and the things that Ian was talking about. Uh, this did, he had a talked about what Terry was doing, this Q sector, which is constant, and then you have this other sector where you have ribosomes and you have other proteins. And so if you invest in ribosomes, you cannot invest in meta metabol metabolism. And so you get these trade-offs and you have to choose these sort of things. And so the idea is very simple. If I have, on my metabolic level, I have some flux. A goes to B. I have a rate. This implies I have a protein that actually catalyzes it. Right? So I need, it's not, a, not an E1, I need an, I need an enzyme one to do this, right? Now, since this whole thing is in a cell that grows, this protein is actually getting diluted by the growth rate. I always use mu, but Ian used lambda, so I'll use lambda for that. 
that's the advantage of using whiteboard actually over, over slides. Um, so there's going to be degradation or dilution of cells in, you know, so, so that implies I actually need to make protein with a certain rate, VE1. Right? And um, now the whole problem here is how much protein do I need? Because I can make a protein balance. The dot, remember, time derivative. Like this. So if that is zero, and if I would know the protein, I would know what this rate should be. Right? So what I need is a coupling between my V1, so my metabolic rate, and my enzyme level. And of course we would need kinetics for that. We're back at kinetics. Uh, uh, let's say, we'll, we'll do this this afternoon, but you will have something like the K-cat, right, of this enzyme times some, some, some Michaelis momentum function, whatever, with our A's and B's here, right? And we don't want this. Um, so one trick, there's a paper out a few weeks ago from Jens Nielsen. If you're interested in this, you should read this. It's really, really interesting. He basically says, okay, and there's actually some arguments. Let's make this thing half. So we're just saying all the enzymes work at half the maximal rate. So that means that, that this, the subset level is around the Km of the enzymes. Right? So we just throw away this and we turn this into a half. And these K cats are found in Brenda, or Louis will measure them for you. And then um, we know this. Or at least we have a coupling now between my rate and my enzyme level. And fire that to this. And this is, again, a metabolic rate. So I can actually now cast this whole thing into a, a sort of an FBA type of model where um, I also have metabolic fluxes for all the protein synthesis enzymes. And you can do this as fine-grained or coarse-grained as you want. Bernard Paulsen has, has a few papers on this. He calls this the me model. So it's metabolism and expression model. And he's doing this in, in really a lot of detail. Um, uh, to so much detail that I sometimes lose track of what he's actually doing. Um, uh, you can do it more coarse-grained, whatever you want to do. But uh, the idea is that we now have a coupling between a rate of the metabolism and the rate of protein synthesis, and now we can add constraints. Could you be even more simple? Assume that all enzymes, the rate is proportional to concentration, period. I know the copy number, I don't care about so No, but you need, you, need, or you need some number there, or you can say it's all equal. Yeah, Fine. Simple well, you, I mean, you can get qualitatively, you get interesting things out. So s switching with the Crabtree effect type of things, you can get out of that. Because in terms of simplification, it's as probably as logic to say that all enzymes are similar as assuming that they are operating at half the rate. It's an assumption. Yeah, it depends on how quantitative you, you want to be and how, uh, you know, Maybe for a few enzymes it does matter. I yeah. mean, we don't, right? That's the problem, of course. But but it's a good start. It's a good start, and that's that's what 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 Jens and we're also playing with is putting this at a half is something that at least the reviewers accepted, and I think it's fair. It's fair. Um, he he looked up the K cats, then started to compute this, um, and so now you can put another constraint. So one of the constraints you can add is there is maybe a sum of total enzyme, which is, you know, the solubility of protein, let's say. There's no, you can fit only so much protein in a cell. So there can be, an cons again, a constraint. It's all about constraints. And there may be another one, which is that the sum of these enzyme rates is a function of the ribosome concentration I have. Right? So, um, or the translation rate, or the initiation rate, or whatever detail you want to add here. But again, it's just a constraint on some of these rates. And now we're getting a sort of an FBA type of framework where it's becoming more realistic, I think. 
And now we can get switching behavior. So now we can get this, this, this thing you may know of the Crabtree effect or the Warburg effect in cancer. Or so that what you typically see is that if you have growth rate here and you uh, plot, um, you typically see um, something like this. So this would be ethanol in yeast or lactate in cancer, or lactate in lactic acid bacteria. And this would be respiration, let's say. Or acetate in lactic acid bacteria. So there's this switch at some, some, some critical growth rate, they start to switch. Um, and FBA would never be able to, the classical FBA cannot predict this. This type of FBA, where you, you put this, this protein cost in the framework, can actually produce this type of results. And this is very exciting, I have to say, as something where the whole cell models can, 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 can benefit. And it's really a matter of how to translate all the biological knowledge that we have into constraints, basically, if you want to do this sort of flux balance analysis properly. I think my time is sort of up. So there's maybe time for you know questions, uh, some discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So really enlightening lecture. Really appreciate it. Okay. I learned a lot. Um, and uh, it's kind of like I'm just really moody to this stuff, but uh, it, it looks like so. If I were to say that flux balance analysis is based upon the steady state equations that you get from the reaction equations. It's it's basically use linear programming and a simplex technique that you yeah, solve exactly. yeah. to solve those equations. Yeah. And it seems like in whole cell modeling, you're probably going to have a lot of equations. And it seems like it seems like the number of constraints would be far less than the number of equations that you're trying to describe for the reactions, and therefore the solution space would not lead you to uh, mm -hmm. a, uh, a unique uh, solution for uh, you know for biomass or you know whatever whatever quantity you're you're looking for. How, how do you? No, that's not. From a computational standpoint, how yeah. do you deal with the variability like? In, in the so what we what what uh, so this this fact that you have this uh, high dimensional sort of so solution space. Yeah. Uh, at the metabolic level, in, the, the optimal space. Let's talk if you want to move. Yeah. So there's two things. So one is there is a big solution space, right. and, the um, and and that gets reduced if you do optimization. And this is something that we could discuss maybe at some point during this this course. In how much optimization do you use or want to use in these whole cell models to fill in gaps? Basically, so because you have this solution space, you don't know, and then you use optimization to find a point, let's say. Well, I guess, with, yeah, I guess if I could just ask the question this way, I mean, there, so there's a full cell model simulator for uh, for mycoplasma, and um, like the, I'm, I guess I'm asking more of a practical question. Mm -hmm. You know, given given the potential for not having enough constraints to define the optimal solution or an optimal solution that there is a variable set of solutions how, mm -hmm. do, how do you pick them how do you I, I think I, I mean, I'm not doing these these whole cell models yet so I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I'm yeah, yeah. The whole, the well that this, this thing is totally open up the whole thing okay really so so what what does happen is as soon as you put these type of additional constraints mm -hmm. on this thing you get a unique solution yes. in FBA also there's no room for maneuver anymore. So that may be a hopeful thing. But of course. My important point, and, and, and this is the problem with flux balance, this is what I'm saying that you need also to know copy number. Like if you look at metabolism of mycoplasma, you will produce ATP with fructose, you will produce ATP with glycerol, with phosphatidylcholine, with glucose, with ascorbate, and with mannitol. But in reality, the bug grows only well with glucose and mannitol. Why? Because fructose, you have 20 copies per number. Glucose enzyme, you have 300 copies per number. Glycerol is the same, so 
the flag balance will tell all these solutions are equally more or less good. Yeah. But in one case you have three copies, 300 copies per number, per cell, and another 20. So the flux balance, the flux to fruit are never going to be high. Yeah. Of course, there are ways to translate that information yeah. into a capacity but constraint. In the knowing the amount of proteins is also very important. Yeah. Because you can find in your metabolic map I have this protein, but if this protein is three copies. Yeah. Yeah, but you can translate it into a capacity constraint to make it more realistic. But we maybe we should discuss this uh, over coffee or so okay. a little bit more, if that's okay, because there's more questions. Related yeah. to this question, so how does, um, I mean, I've brought uh, optimal solution space related to the roughness of the system that we're studying. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> what was the question? So the question is, whether the fact that you have this large solution space has it anything to do with robustness or maybe flexibility or something like that. Um, I don't think we know. There is a very interesting paper by Urs Sauer and Matthias Heinemann a few years ago in Science, I think, where they said, okay, so um, they do sort of a multi-objective uh, optimization. So not just one objective, but they have three. Um, and then, then um, you could see, I have to remember exactly what they did, that, that suboptimal solutions would, could be better. Mm -hmm. uh, that has nothing to do with your robustness, I think, but more maybe with flexibility. But of course, what we're doing here is, is a caricature of, of a real cell. It's just one objective and optimizing everything for that. It's great for biotech where you actually want to do that. But a cell, of course, wants to be flexible, robust, and all these things. Yeah, so you have to be. It's a paper in Science. Uh, yeah. um, Uwe Sauer and Matthias Heinemann are co authors, I know. Yeah. It's called so Talk to this guy. <laughs> He's also called Uwe, but another Uwe. Yeah. Uh, also, the, the interesting point is if you will know the environment in which your inner, your bacteria will live. Would you also derive the constraints in a way? Because the thing is that the pack we need to think that it has been is living in a certain environment. So mm -hmm. the concentration fluxes will be adapted already to that environment. Mm -hmm. And I think if we know the environment in a way, we can constrain also the. Because the, it's not that the pack can suddenly express 10,000 copies of this protein because you want to do it. It's the promoter will be limited because he was living in an environment mm -hmm. that we've never seen that substrate more than it. Yeah, that's true. Um, I don't know, we, we never incorporated the, the environment where the pack is living to make the model, I think. Well, one, one, one thing is an anecdote. We actually used this FBAs to improve uh, biomass formation in a biotechnological application, viral, uh, 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 vaccine production. And there we we tuned the amino acid concentration to the requirement in the biomass. So we measured the biomass amino acid composition and then tuned the amino acid composition. And we got quite a strong improvement in the toxin, toxin production, but which may say, OK, maybe they, they are in the natural environment, they start to make toxin or something. I don't know. That still, you will be constrained by the evolution of the bacteria. That sure. you will never be able to get out of this unless you start doing something drastic. Yeah, I agree. No. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in case when we have variables in the fluxes, mm -hmm. like uh, a case that we showed, mm -hmm. so how does FBA decide like, which point to show? You know? I haven't systematically analyzed that, but it, I think it's sort of chance. Yeah, I think it's. It's when I haven't done it a thousand times with the same problem to see if it always ends up in, yeah, in the same. I don't. I'm, I don't know enough about the simplex algorithm and how sensitive it is to numerical issues. It with is deterministic, so your solver should give you the same flux phenotype every time. But there's a way that you can, if you're using an API for one of these solvers. You can explore different vertices of your, I forget what they call that, the flux cone. Yeah. And so you can explore the alternative flux phenotypes that way.
Does that answer your question? You should talk to him. There, was a lot. <laughs> there were a lot of wordy words in that <laughs> explanation. Uh, you have the point uh, about T versus rate in FBA. Can, can you develop Sorry, it? Is you, you mentioned yield versus rate. In yeah, yield versus rate, yeah. Okay. I, I missed that. Okay. Um, so, basically, what you do is I, I pour in at a certain rate, let's say 10 of something, right? And I have these two options. I can, I can make product uh, uh, one and product two, say, and here um, I get two ATP and here I get three ATP. And I want to maximize ATP production, let's say. Right, so that's what I want to do. But I have this constraint. I only have, you only have 10 molecules per second or so at your spot. So then if you want to maximize ATP production, it's obvious you would have to pick this because you get 30, right? So, but this, this 30 you get out is completely dependent on this 10 that you put in here. And so basically you, you, you find a high yield strategy. Yield, I don't know if you know what yield actually means. A yield is how much do I get from something else, right? So the, so the yield here would be three. The yield here would be two, right? And the rate is the actual rate, right? So I can have, I can grow fast in a race car, for instance, or not grow, but r race fast <laughs> in a race car, right? And I would need a lot of fuel to do that. So my yield, how much kilometers I can actually drive per fuel unit is going to be low, but my rate will be high, right? And I can, I can pick, uh, I don't know, a, a Toyota Prius or something like that, right? I can be very efficient and have a high yield uh, on mileage, but I'll have to be slow. And there seems to be trade-offs there that I haven't had time to really talk about. But so, so that's the difference. So that's around uh, the question of uh, growth versus production of other uh, subjects, for instance, right? For, for instance, yeah. So, so what products you, you will find? It's always those products that would give you the highest yield. Those products you will find.